All right, we're recording. All right, can you all see the screen? Yes. Do you see NCMI Live? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, great, thank you. All right, Michael, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, great. So I went ahead and muted everyone. Again, don't be offended at that. Um, I would like to give uh, just a, a brief introduction as I normally did. I didn't do that with last week uh, with Michael um, because at that point he was more important, but right now he's not as important as my introduction. <laughs> so, all right, here we go. Um, our channel is NCMI Live if you want to find these recordings or uh, find them to either watch them again if there was anything that was unclear that Michael and I might have said. Uh, you can go back and listen to it. And, um, and that can be helpful sometimes because, you know, we don't, well, Michael does, but I don't always explain things in the most perfect manner. And, uh, you know, I've watched some of Michael's stuff. It's just flawless basically and so <laughs> uh, but uh no i know it's sometimes we don't uh, we're not you know we're trying to get through our text and we don't always touch on things and sometimes i might go a little bit too quickly um, but also you can copy the link and send it to your friends um, if you found something that was encouraging or edifying uplifting drew out praise from you and i really mean that you know i don't want that to sound cliche uh, we want our messages more than anything to draw out praise by the Spirit of God so that when we're done with our message, I always, I always tell people this, um, the number one goal in any message that I ever give is that people would have a loftier view of Jesus Christ. Amen. That, that's, that's my goal. And uh, it's not to have a bunch of knowledge um, because just a bunch of knowledge, as we know, puffs up, makes us arrogant. But I want people to um, be in utter adoration of Christ, utter amazement um, by the end of a message. And not, not to pat me or Michael on the back, but that's, that's what we want for everyone. So <clears throat> anyway, so go to YouTube and then NCMI Live. And then also, I do want to thank everybody for showing up. You can subscribe to our channel. You can support NCMI Live at patreon.com forward slash NCMI Live. And you can visit the website that I have not updated in a long time called newcreationministries.tv. I'm currently looking for a, a web, website developer to help out with that. So pray, pray that I could do that because I have got a truckload of articles that I have not uploaded to NCMI Live. And I mean that. I actually... Uh, put them all on paper and they filled up a just kidding so all right explaining raku it's just my cute little method or cute little acronym of interpreting old testament biblical prophecy and i think it's an ironclad method r recognize what was hidden before christ and i encourage everybody to check that one out uh it's it's it might not be the most important, but it may be the most, uh, for lack of a better term, helpful in, in laying the groundwork for this. It's a, it's a very interesting study. Appeal to divine interpretation. We don't trust ours. We don't trust our feelings. We don't trust our own dispensational, some sort of dispensational or literal hermeneutic. We always appeal to Jesus and the apostles for interpretation of the nature of Old Testament biblical prophecy concerning the Messianic kingdom. Course number three, 
Keep Christ front and center. This is the most important part of this entire series. Not to make upholding context, context anticlimactic, but that number three is the most important aspect. Christ is to be kept front and center. He is to be seen in all of the scriptures. And I believe that Jesus is Yahweh of the Old Testament. And I believe that's one of the reasons we don't really see the word Yahweh in the New Testament, but we see the word Jesus. Uh, well over 900 times, as I've mentioned, in the New Testament, proportionally, that's just about the same as the word Yahweh is used over 9,000 times. In, like I said, in proportion to the amount of text written in the Old Testament. So we're on upholding context. This is crucial for understanding the connectivity between various prophetic elements in, for instance, our particular um, text, Isaiah 52 through 55. So this is part six, I believe. And we're looking at Isaiah 55 today. And, um, and if we could just kind of go through this, read the text, and then I, I've, this time I put a few notes Michael, I put a few notes next to mine, uh, but I've just got the text, so we're, we're, we're going to read through. I'm going to just, if you wouldn't mind doing it again, reading through the text, and then I'll sort of start, and uh, my, as I show the verses on the left-hand side, you will see some cross-references, some of which are the same as when I was going through picking out the elements that were alluded to or quoted in the New Testament. But because we're doing this exegetically, we're also going to examine this passage in far more detail. So uh, as I brushed over it, looking at the prophecies only, the prophecies that were declared to be fulfilled, we know all of it's fulfilled, but the ones that are specifically identified in the New Testament, uh, that, was, that was just brief. But we are doing an actual exegesis of it and uh, doing it to the best of our ability, Lord willing. So, uh, Michael, would you mind going ahead and reading this? And then this time I'll go ahead and start it, and then uh, we can just, again, tag team together. Sounds great. Um, that's the NASB translation you have on the screen. Matter of fact, I'll just read from the screen. Yeah, you can read from the screen or read from yours, and I'll just uh, adjust it, uh, you know, as best I can. Okay, sounds good. Here we go, Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 13. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for, that, for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for, for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you, because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word, which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth in shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up, and instead of the nettle and the myrtle, 
the myrtle will come up and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. All right, so what I've done here, uh, and this is sort of a subversive way of keeping Michael involved with this uh, study. <laughs> uh, there's, I, I highly doubt that we're going to make it through Isaiah 55, which means that Michael has to stay with us until we finish it because he made a promise before the Lord. So, <laughs> so um, I have placed some passages over the, to the right that I believe are very much related to our text. And the reason I place these passages over there is to just jog your memory. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have read all of these passages. But one of the areas that I've spent quite a deal of time in studying is the broad picture of redemption. That is, instead of myopically examining a context just within itself, like, like so many, I especially find this true, sadly, even though I'm sovereign grace, I find this true, sadly, in reformed circles where they are very... Uh, they're very myopic. They, they will take one text of scripture and they pride themselves on exegesis. And it's wonderful. You know, uh, Calvary Chapel, they do the same thing. I, it's to be admired, you know, that Chuck Smith, uh, who started the Calvary Chapel movement, it's to be admired that he wants to do, uh, approach scripture with an exegetical method that is just going through the, 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 the text verse by verse. I think that's wonderful. But I think all too often, especially the, the reformers, what they do is they, they look at a context and then they read all the commentaries that they can find on that context to find out the very flowery methods and words that other reformers have used to describe the text. And that's all fine and dandy as long as it's teaching truth. But unfortunately, they separate it from the broad picture of redemption and the purpose of, uh, of God's redemptive plan in history and establishing his kingdom. What's the Bible about? Uh, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day, um, and, and he, was, he was emphasizing how refreshing it was that I've taught from the scripture that it's about two things comparing Christ's righteousness with self-righteousness. And that's what the Bible is about, from the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the judgment of the Pharisees according to their works versus the tree of life at the end, Revelation 22. That's what the Bible's about. The Gospels, Jesus' message is all about Christ's righteousness versus self-righteousness. Paul's epistles, Christ's righteousness versus self-righteousness. The prophet Isaiah, Christ's righteousness versus self-righteousness. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the list goes on. And so that is important for us to understand. Again, as we mentioned last week, it's not about cosmological history. Not at all. It is about redemptive history, God entering into covenant with a nation and fulfilling that covenant in the person and work of Jesus Christ and establishing a new covenant, an everlasting covenant, having set his tabernacle and his presence, his dwelling in his people so that we would be a city on a hill, a light to lighten the nations. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of give that introduction. And then I'm just going to read these verses right here off to the right, just on this first slide. And then we can move forward. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Let's look over Revelation 22 again, dealing with the broad picture. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who's thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. So I think they're very similar there. The prophet Isaiah is talking about Jesus. He is our wine and he is our milk. He is our waters. 
We drink freely. And it's not speaking. Some translations in Revelation say freely, and people think, oh, see, that's speaking about the freedom of the will. Absolutely not even related to what it's saying. It's talking about the value of it that is priceless, but you don't pay for it. That the gospel is without cost. That grace is free. And so that the one who is thirsty, they understand they're thirsty. They come to the revelation by God's grace that they're thirsty. And they come, as we're going to see in a beautiful passage in Psalms, Lord willing, later on. And then, of course, related to these waters, I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. Michael, comments on that? Well, I like that you highlighted Isaiah 41 as we see that that text is going to lead into what we're reading here in uh, 55. And obviously it's on the heels of what we talked about last week in regards to righteousness, God's righteousness being given to the saints, the heritage of the, of the, the saints. So um, I, I love that. And I imagine the Psalm that you're going to look at is uh, Psalm 42, um, where, you know, my, my soul thirsts for God. Um, and we see that that chapter ends up talking about righteousness. Again, God working on behalf of his people. Uh, I also think of Matthew chapter 5 in that the Beatitudes there, where it says, those who thirst and hunger for righteousness uh, shall be filled. Um, we know that all of this is, all of this, all that we're seeing here in Isaiah, um, Revelation, the Psalms, the whole biblical narrative, if you will, is pointing to that, that righteousness that will come from God. And, and one thing I just wanted to make mention of that stood out to me was um, why it says uh, by wine and milk. So that, that stood out to me and I did a little bit of reading and, and the very basic answer would be wine would symbolize joy in the Old Testament, you know, language there and milk would represent nourishment. Mm -hmm. So what we see coming to us here in these passages, which again, I, on the heels of Isaiah 54, the heritage of the saints should bring forth joy and it should bring forth nourishment in regards to living in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and uh, I think that uh, that that word by there probably could be compared with what Jesus said over in uh, John. Let me see if I can skip over here. Uh, there it is. Um, hmm. Let me go back here. There it is, where Jesus says, do not work for the food which perishes, but the implication is work. It, he, he's, it's a play on words here, obviously, uh, because he says, they said, what must we do that we may work the works of God? And he says, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. So do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of indicate that. But yeah, good good word about the nourishment and joy. And I think that that's so interesting that God does use wine to symbolize joy, the new wine. And uh, I think we talked maybe a little bit about new wine and old wineskins. Uh, Edward brought it up, I think. Isn't that right? Yeah, Edward, you should raise your hand. Didn't you bring that up last week? I don't know if you can hear me, but it seems like he brought it up. Yes. But yeah, so uh, going on to this, the, this next page, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Now, I believe that this is speaking about Jesus. I believe Jesus is talking here. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? That this is prophetic. And as I've mentioned before, and I'm sure some would disagree, but um, I'm, I'm just, it, it's coming across more and more clearly to me every time I study the Psalms, that the Psalms are, as I've said, the thoughts of Christ and the Gospels are the words of Christ. That the Psalms are the thoughts of Christ during his ministry and particularly in his passion, but that the Gospels are the words, the actual actions and words of Jesus Christ. And I believe that this has to do with Christ bearing the sin, speaking uh, in, a, in a personification type of way for Israel. My soul, remember Jesus is called Israel in Isaiah. 
And so he, he speaks as sort of the head, uh, uh, the head of Israel, just like Jeremiah did in Lamentations. And just like Paul, I believe, does in Romans chapter 7. When he says, I am Carl, I believe he's speaking on behalf of Israel. And I believe that this is Jesus saying, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? As he was bearing the sins of God's people, he longed to be brought out from death, brought out from the law. He was born under the law, born of a woman, born under law. When shall I come and appear before God? Well, where's, where's the appearance before God? We know that's in the holiest of all. And then Psalm 143, verse 6, I stretch my hands out to you. My soul longs for you in a parched land. In other words, he's speaking about the dryness of Israel, the barrenness of Israel, who could not bring forth salvation. And at last, Jesus comes, not only to save Israel, but then to find all those throughout all nations, throughout all time, in this ever-increasing government. Israel simply represents the human heart at large. They were this test. They were the guinea pig for what hum the human heart. That's why the Bible speaks so much about the nature of the human heart. Uh, the heart is sick. The heart is deceitful above all things. Israel was given the law to show the nature of the human heart and what the nature of the human heart does when given law. And so now Christ comes and he's the light to the nations. And so no longer is there a parched land because Christ entered first into the presence of God and he brought us with him. Michael? Amen. Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing up Psalm 143.6 as it beautifully aligns with what you said there in Isaiah 41. Uh, you see the wilderness there uh, will become, because of the righteousness of God, the wilderness will become a pool of water and dry land will become fountains of water. So um, you know, I have this quote I wrote on this passage here. It said, God will quench the thirst of those who desire him as a man in the Arizona desert with a canteen craves water. And um, you, you see that that's what we're talking about here is God providing righteousness for that old covenant people that were in bondage to this law, that they thought this was their way to uh, produce righteousness, which unfortunately all that it manifested was self-righteousness, which mm -hmm. is what I believe the Apostle Paul is getting at in Galatians when he says that the law was given as a tutor uh, to, to lead those to the need for a savior, to paraphrase a bit there. Um, but again, I, I see that being highlighted. And I, I, again, it's all of this should be reminding us of the beautiful riches that we have in Christ and, and how, yes, um, contextually, we know this is speaking about Israel longing for God, Israel being that dry land. But then we also know that we can find and prayerfully we can, each of us can find our, our identity in these passages as well as we are united to Christ. We can see uh, how those would be our thoughts, just as you highlight with Psalms being Christ's thoughts prayerfully as we grow in the grace and knowledge of God, that we see the Psalms becoming our thoughts and you know ways that we put on Christ. So right. absolutely, I believe it's beautiful. Again, it, it, this whole text should be reminding us of the riches that we have in Christ. Amen, amen. Yeah, and, and as we're going to see later, uh, the theme of satisfaction is, is a regular occurrence in prophetic texts, mm -hmm. satisfaction, and, and that there is this dissatisfaction with works. Why? Because when we trust in works, it produces a spirit of judgment and a spirit of this this deep, gross, pharisaic knowledge that, yeah, you are not all you claim to be, but because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, it convinces itself that it has the right to judge another person. Mm. And there's no satisfaction in that because all it does is produce division. But the beautiful thing about the gospel when Christ saves us, is it levels the playing field, puts everybody on the same level of deceitful, above all things, desperately wicked, drinking iniquity like water. And once you realize that that's what we are apart from Christ, you look upon everybody else with love. And the Bible says love is the bond of completion. There's no satisfaction in division. 
That's why there's always bitterness, there's always judgment, and there's always schism in places that do not practice mercy. When mercy is not practiced, there's always division. But when mercy is practiced, there is no division. Yeah, you know, Ward, I want to say something there. I have a quote that I regularly love. I know Edward will know this quote. Um, I say it at church all the time, or I say it when I gather with the church, if we're uh, saying it correctly there. Um, it's a John Piper quote, and he says, God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. And for me, that's been a hallmark of, you know, of what the Christian faith should look like is finding satisfaction in Christ. And, you know, and I, I do want to uh, mention, I hope you don't mind, the video you did a bit earlier today, that, that video reminded me of that. That video, when you talked about uh, living a life of gratitude, you know, we see in Timothy that godliness with contentment, or contentment with godliness either, or um, you could go both ways with that, um, are, are great gain. And, you know, what you reminded me of was not only living a life of gratitude, but also you mentioned that in that video, not judging one another. And, you know, I appreciate that about you because that's been something that I've seen very consistently from you is not, you know, judging our brothers. And that's, again, as Christians, you know, for, you know, I'll be all too human here and admit that I need that rebuke every once in a while. I need that reminder to know that, you know, get off your high horse. Uh, do not become more like those that have self-righteousness but rather seek the righteousness that has come from God, which does not come with man judging his brother. And, and you highlighted in that video, I do encourage everyone to go back and visit NCMI Live on YouTube and watch that video. Um, but again, that's the satisfaction. The satisfaction that we have in Christ is that we've been given everything, as the Apostle Peter says, uh, pertaining to life and godliness. So it's not about me seeking out those things, making you know, some sort of human effort at attaining those things, but rather resting in Christ, knowing that these things have been provided to me through Jesus and, and hopefully growing, you know, as I put on Christ, as I mentioned before, I, I see the attitude of judging others or any of those uh, negative things that are listed. You know, you could go, if you want a, a list of negatives, uh, you could go ahead and visit uh, Galatians chapter five, um, uh, first Corinthians six, you know, these are things that we should be growing away from and growing more in. So as I think through satisfaction, and of course, I wrote in my notes here on 55.2, uh, where it talks about, listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. That, mm -hmm. And that's what is supposed to satisfy. If uh, a text I regularly cite, cite is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where it says to examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. So, you know, we need to delight ourselves in good, which is a part of our examining everything, a part of our growing in the faith. Um, and when I say everything, hopefully, I'm not only talking about the Bible, you know, I'm talking about examining everything carefully, um, things that we do with our lives, attitudes that we have. Um, again, so there's a lot in here that is applicational for our lives and also applicational for our doctrine. So, you know, I, I really do. I believe that, um, as you said, the theme of satisfaction, I believe that to be of utmost importance when it comes to the Christian life. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, that next verse over there from Psalm 63, oh God, you are my God. And again, I do believe that this is Christ speaking. Now, as I say that, I want to reemphasize that we too because we are in Christ, we have found this to be true in our lives. When God revealed to us our need, we sought him earnestly by his grace. When we thirsted for God, that was the revelation, but Christ was the one who did it on his own. Amen. Because he didn't have a heart that was separated from God in terms of his, uh, his impeccable quality. He was sinless, tempted in all ways, yet without sin. So this is Christ, though, bearing sin. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. And by extension, we are his flesh. The Bible says we are members of his flesh and of his bones. But specifically, Old Testament Israel were his flesh. And he was speaking on their behalf. My flesh, I, as the head of Israel, my flesh yearns for you. We yearn for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Thus, 
I have beheld you in the sanctuary. Extremely important for our view of the church, our view of ecclesiology, and our view of soteriology. That is the church and salvation. Where do we behold God? In the church, not in the building. But once we have entered into the church, which is the new Jerusalem, once we enter in by faith, we are now beholding God and we see his power and his glory. That's where we, we behold God. And that was the goal of Christ as he was bearing sin is to come back and to have that union absolutely as deity, but also in the salvation of him from the sin that he wore. He was begotten, the word of God says. I believe that that begotten took place upon his resurrection, that he was begotten, begotten into the glory of God, the first be begotten from the dead, and that the Bible says that we have been begotten of him as well. That is, we're born again. Christ wasn't born again because of his own sins, but because he bore our sins. It's so important that we clarify that because people get all over my case when they say, you believe Christ was born again? Yes, but not the way you think it. <laughs> You're thinking that he had sin and that he needed to be born again. No, he became sin. He became our sin. So that's very important. Sorry, I'm belaboring that. But to see your glory and your power. And of course, just emphasizing more of this living waters. If any man come to me, let him drink. Revelation 21. It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Just kind of backtracking a little bit. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life. What? Again, without cost. And we already saw that one. Uh, eat what is good. So now we're going to kind of. Um, merge into what Michael was talking about. Now, I'm going to take a little bit different uh, direction on that, Michael, if you don't mind. Eat what is good. So I believe the context in Isaiah 55 is the gospel. The context in Isaiah 55 is come buy wine and milk without price. If you're thirsty, come. Eat that which is good. So, so what does this mean? Jesus said, eat my flesh drink my blood. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And that seems to me to be where Isaiah, it's not to say, not to say that what Michael was saying is not appropriate and wonderful and beautiful. Um, but as I'm looking at this from more of a prophetic standpoint, as opposed to a, an application standpoint, and I do believe that all of the texts, all of the scriptures we study, we should, we should seek to find their meaning in Christ, and we should seek to find who God is and what he's done, but we should also seek to find how they apply to our lives. Right. So absolutely. So as we, as we look at this, though, the direction that I'm seeing Isaiah is eat what is good. That is, Christ is what is good. Christ is the reward there, okay? So any thoughts on that, Michael, as we move into this issue of satisfaction and what you touched on, you, you read the verse, you, uh, I didn't switch the, uh, the slide, but you read the verse, delight yourself in abundance. Comments? Yeah, well, uh, amen. I'm following along with you. I like to, I'm listening to what you're saying. I think you're bringing out some good points there. We started out uh, highlighting that revelation, another writing by John, again, you know, there's a bunch of conversation there, but, uh, you, you know, um, we, we saw this apostolic writing, uh, the revelation of Christ, and how it pointed to that, that come and drink mentality there. So I think it's fitting that we would look at the Gospel of John and see how John is going to pull out these, uh, these messianic details, if you will. Uh, so I'm encouraged by that, and um, I, I want to hear more of what you have to say in that regard. Sure, absolutely. So this, this, uh, there's a beautiful passage. It started in the lower right-hand corner, if you would. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Now, the word fullness is a Hebrew term that actually is referring to satisfaction. And it, 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 it's, it, many times in these prophetic contexts, it's connected with food. So I believe that in these contexts that we are seeing now, the reference has to do, it's a metaphorical reference pointing to the fact that in Christ, there's no more starvation. Now, we know that as Israel went into captivity to Assyria and Judah 
with Babylon? Whenever a nation gets overtaken by another nation or there's a catastrophe or something, there's always going to be some sort of famine. It's always going to be a struggle with obtaining food. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us if, if that happens with us. Hey, okay, Lord, Lord's in charge. But that's, that's a common occurrence whenever there's an exchange of power, okay, or a, a being overcome by other nations. There's always, um, there's always food issues that happen because of civil unrest and societal unrest. So God here is saying that the real problem, if you guys understood your, your issue, you are hungry spiritually. You guys are all caught up with trying to get your bellies filled. As they, Jesus said, you're following me because your bellies were filled. Labor not for the meat that perishes, but for that which endures to everlasting life. I'm the only way you're going to get filled. So in your presence is fullness of joy. Now, now make these comparisons of presence and light and glory and food and waters and satisfaction. So up in Psalm 22, verse 26, which is the whole psalm is clearly about Christ. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. I believe this is Jesus. I believe that this is eating of his flesh, drinking of his blood, not as the Catholics teach, but as what it truly means. And Jesus explains, believing on him. Those who seek him, back to Michael's observation in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will worship before you. So notice here that the nations are included during this time of satisfaction, again, which is the Hebrew word Saba, which is the same Hebrew word down in Psalm 16. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is Saba, satisfaction of joy. Isn't that wonderful? Well, what did Jesus say? These things I have written to you that your what? Joy, I have spoken to you that your joy may be full. In your presence is fullness of joy. Well, what is the number one way Jesus the context was clear. It was loving one another. The, the, he says, we assure our hearts before him when we love one another. What is the greatest way? We know the joy is already there. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost, right? So we know it has nothing to do with physical food. The joy is always there. It doesn't feel joyful, but it is always there because we're in Christ, just like we don't always feel at peace or righteous righteousness. But we always have those things. They're constants. So you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. So what it means to be in Christ and loving one another, when we love one another, we experience the fullness of joy. Hmm. When we're not, when we're in division, that joy doesn't feel like it's present. When we're demonstrating mercy one, to, one toward another, we're experiencing that fullness of joy. It doesn't mean that when we're going through times of not being merciful, that we don't have the joy of the Lord, that we don't have peace with God, that we're not in, in the righteousness of Christ and, and just totally covered in the righteousness of Christ. But when we're not loving one another, or at least uh, having these feelings of division or grudge or bitterness, we don't feel the reality that we have. And that's why he said, when we love one another, we assure our hearts before him. We assure our hearts. We, we, it, it gives us confidence. I'm the Lord's. I am the Lord's. That's why John is so emphatic about how important love is. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I definitely am following along with you. I'm enjoying that. I went ahead and I, I was thinking about how I see all throughout the law and all throughout the prophets where God, um, he tells the people that if they walk in disobedience, they will experience famine. And uh, we see a part where in Amos 8.11, he specifically told them that it would not be about hungering for food and thirsting for water, so to speak, but it would be about hungering and uh, hung, having hunger and thirsting for the word of the Lord which again, we know would point to the time of the Messiah. Amen. And I also found another Psalm that I just wanted to bring up to add to your uh, repertoire there. Uh, Psalm chapter 37, verses 18 through 19. What I find interesting is it mentions the inheritance, which we talked about 
in Isaiah 54. The Lord knows the days of the blameless and their inheritance will last forever. In the time of evil, they will not be ashamed. And in the days of famine, they will be satisfied. So again, that, that goes right there in what you're talking about. And uh, obviously you see the messianic promise kind of enveloping that whole, that whole uh, psalm, the, the, the words of the psalm, so to speak. Right. And I see how that perfectly fits in here with talking about salvation and righteousness, uh, which we've been talking about as the heritage of the saints. Amen. Amen. It's so, it's so interconnected, you know, and uh, it just so happens that the believers in the Old Testament, they had this love one for another but they didn't have the inheritance yet. Mm. And so when the time would come for the unveiling of, and, and procurement of salvation by Christ, they would get the inheritance. Not that they earned it, but they were displaying the love for one another that Christ says is the character of the kingdom of God. Mm. It's beautiful. Uh, and Psalm 36 <clears throat> related Again, here, here we're going to look at some, some words here. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. And the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. And again, I believe this is new covenant here. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house. And this word abundance is, is fatness. And we have a tendency to look at <laughs> fatness as something that's negative. Now, perhaps obesity is negative, <laughs> but this, you know, the peasants, the ones who were starving, were emaciated. They didn't have fatness, they had what was called leanness. You know, you. Do you want a lean steak or do you want a steak with lots of marbling, right? So I think that's what we're getting at here. They shall drink their fill of the fatness of your house. So notice what it connects here. Sanctuary, we saw before, the glory of God. House, fatness, connected, the church, God's people, were satisfied. Psalm 42, he, he, he received joy when he walked into the house of God's people. And you do give them drink of the river of your delights, which is kind of interesting here. It's the same Hebrew word as Eden, in the Garden of Eden. You will give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you, and, and that conjunction... That, that conjunction there is important. For with you is the fountain of life. And in your light, we see light. So Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is the light of life. And the associations here are clear. We have Eden, restoration to God's presence, fatness with the house of God in the light of Christ, Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to those to the upright in heart. I want you to just look at something real quick. Uh, they are filled with the fatness of your house. And so I'm, I want to look at a different translation. In Young's literal, it says, they drink their fill, or I'm sorry, uh, New American, they drink their fill of the abundance of your house. They're totally satisfied with the fatness of the church, God's people, the joy that brings. And you do give them to drink of the river of your delight. However, Young's literal words it this way. They are filled with the fatness of your house and the stream of your delights. You do cause them to drink. And I looked at other ways that the word cause this the same hebrew word is used and it is used many times where it is used as 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 something that is causative based upon what god is doing and you get the picture of us as just dead and god just pouring water in us mm. you know just giving us water you know you've heard 
you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. That's not true with God. Amen. God led us to water and he made us drink. And, and I just think it's so beautiful that all these things are connected there. Again, light, the house, the rivers, the delights, the abundance, the fatness, and of course, his righteousness. Michael? No, amen. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm following along. I think you're right on. You're right on. You know, again, it's just talking about a lot of the riches. Uh, and I think as we continue to move through this chapter, we'll see even more of those riches in the sovereignty and how God ultimately, uh, you know, I'll just say this, uh, moving into that next verse, uh, verse three, where it talks about inclining your ear and come to him. Mm -hmm. um, listen that you may live. And obviously you already brought up John chapter uh, six, you know, in John 10, we see where Jesus Christ says that his sheep hear his voice. They come to him. They're, they are those who hear his voice and thus live. So we see how all of this is just beautifully pointing to the, the Messiah and the sureness of the Messiah. Um, obviously in the old covenant, they were waiting for, um, you might even dare I say that they were since the time of Eve, they've been waiting for a deliverer that would, uh, you know, crush the head of the serpent that would deliver the people from their unrighteousness or their self, which was their self-righteousness. And um, again, so I, I see it very clearly how it's all me very messianic. And I, I love how you've tied it together with the Psalms. Amen. Yeah, it, it is beautiful. And, and so uh, refreshing to those of us who see how how this applies to us in the kingdom of God today and what God's people need today for, like you're saying, nourishment, you know, milk and wine. I mean, you know, I, I always try to emphasize how important it is that we understand our ministry to the church. Fundamentally important is our ministry to the church. Evangelism is not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. It's super important but it is not the most important thing. Paul wrote to the church how they need to treat each other. When Jesus said, they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another, it's people looking in from the outside, seeing how we treat one another. Hmm. And that is super important. And so I always go to Isaiah chapter 40, where he says, comfort my people. Comfort my people. And so many, and Tony, I know you understand this very well, having been involved in Sovereign Grace circles. We, we Sovereign Gracers, we love Sovereign Grace. But in our, in our heritage, Tony, uh, I know you've been exposed to this and seen Sovereign Grace preachers. Um, they're very big on preaching harshly to the church, preaching legalism now they wouldn't say that we're saved by works but they would preach they would preach obedience in such a way as to try and scare us to make the church afraid and if if we're not performing well you know if we're not dotting all our i's and crossing our t's but the bible says restore people when they're overtaken in a fall comfort my people cry unto her that her warfare is over and that her iniquity is pardoned. And I believe that that is the number one task of every able minister of the New Testament, which he says we all are. And that is to restore and comfort one another. And, uh, and then that is our chief way of evangelism. Amen. That's how we evangelize is when the world sees how Christians are loving one another and restoring and forgiving one another and bestowing mercy and grace on one another. Man, the world is like, they are different. You know, it's not freaking political bashing. It's not getting caught up in all the, uh, all the fray of the world. The world needs to see something different. And they don't see that in, in, militaristic evangelicalism they don't see that all they see the same thing just battling and bickering and fighting and and still swords you know swords and spears instead of uh, pruning hooks and, and plow plowshares beat your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks you know that's that, that's what the world needs to see that's that's why he said they will know you're my disciples by your love you christians you believers 
when the world sees you loving on each other, that's what's going to draw them in. Amen. Well said. Nothing to say after that. Amen. <laughs> um, just this last verse, uh, real quick here. Uh, for I will turn there. This is from Jeremiah. I, and notice the associations again. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them joy for their sorrow. Surely he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. I will fill the soul of the priests with abundance. There's that fatness again. And my people shall be satisfied with what? My goodness. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Church, that's what satisfies us, is the goodness of God in the land of the living, in the house of God. That's right. You know, that, that makes it seem as though majority of our time, and just to kind of highlight and maybe to reorient my mind across what you're saying there, um, most of our time should be spent on reminding the saints of their heritage and that, that which they should have joy in and that which they are nourished by, that they are cared for. Um, so the majority of our time would be spent on that, not on the, you know, I even love one of the things you mentioned in that video I mentioned earlier, um, in regards to God is praying for you is, the, um, you know, getting bogged down with uh, Trinitarian or oneness or all these different understandings of God. But instead of, again, good, healthy study, contextual study is very important. However, what would we look like if the majority of our time was spent by loving on our brothers, reminding them that the Lord cares for you, reminding them that the Lord hears your prayers, that the spirit intercedes for you, or that you know, reminding them of the reasons we could be overjoyed. You know, my favorite passage lately has been uh, that God has given everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. I think there's so much that needs to be dug into in re reference to that text. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. You know, the abundance of that text alone um, should create joy within us and should be spent, you know, we could spend more time on that than, uh, you know, the host of other exegetical contextual studies that a lot of people like to kind of focus in on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let me, uh, let me unmute. We're, we're just about on time here, not out of time, but on time. Uh, there we go. All participants are unmuted. And then, um, There we go. All right. Well, man, any any thoughts on what we went over? We, there were there were uh, there was a lot packed in there, and I hope that uh, we all were able to kind of grasp most of it. Can we now share in comments? Yes, you yes. can. Absolutely. Oh, not yet. Okay, not yet. Okay. No, no. Edward, please do. Yeah, share, Edward. Edward, I got a question for you. Can you hear me? Edward, can you hear us? Edward. <laughs> Edward. Edward, can you hear us? Uh, Edward, we can hear you. Talk. <laughs> I think he somehow uh turned off his volume maybe he can't hear us yeah i send him a message on the chat hoping that he'll share anyone else while edward's figuring out his sound situation i have a question ward yeah Jax. I mean, first one, um, where it says, um, without money, even valuable wine 
and milk, apparently. Um, any idea why that's translated no instead of uh, the Greeks uh, stakus, which means like an ear of corn? Uh, you cut out there. Can you say that again? Yeah, I'm wondering why they translate um, <clears throat> the word um, right after wine. Uh, let me get to the ESV. I'm sorry. Um, to buy wine and milk. Um, I noticed that, that the term there is is the Greek um, stakus. And it means fat, or it's translated fatling in the ABP, which also it's referring to an ear of corn or an ear of grain, which actually to me makes more sense because in verse two it's talking about bread loaves. So you're talking about if you take it from that perspective, wine and bread, that's the symbols of six Passover. That's taking Christ in. You're, you're talking about verse one? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'm looking at Young's literal. He says, come buy and eat, yea, come buy wine, buy without money and without price, wine and milk. And, and, I'm just trying to figure why they translated that milk. Now, I know it, the ESV has it that way. But I also know some of the other translations don't. And when you look that up, it's referring to an ear of, or an ear of grain, which would make more sense because when he goes into verse two, he's talking about bread. Um, and that's what they would be buying would be the wine and the grain. And that's those perfect symbols of himself. Come take, eat, come drink my blood take, eat my, my bread. That's, you know, you see what I'm saying there? It's just really interesting. I can't figure out why that got translated milk in some versions. And when that word in Greek means an ear of grain. Well, in, in uh, I'm just, I'm just looking here. Um, it, it says that it's the Hebrew word kalab. And I'm, which which translation are you using again? I'm using the ABP, and I let's see. I think also in I can't remember which other one. Brenton might also have a different word there. Well, let's see. Uh, Brenton's got fat. Um, and the ABP has got fatling, but when you look up that word, it's, uh, it's, it's in the Greek anyway, it's, I um, can't pronounce it, stakos. When you say Greek, are you talking about the Septuagint? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Sept, maybe the Septuagint, let me, let me look here. So you're looking at the LXX. Uh, Oh, it might be LXX, yeah. And I'm just, just interesting to me because it, it would fit better if it was translated as an ear of corn because that represents the grain to bread, which is what he talks about in verse 2. And since Christ is the first fruit mm -hmm. of the barley, he is mm -hmm. that grain, he is the wave sheaf, and he is the Passover bread, it ties ties in with that better than the idea of milk does. So I just thought that was really curious how there's two different versions of that. Yeah, it's what's what's weird is I, as I'm looking at the Septuagint, it appears to be translating it as silver. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, but the Hebrew word is definitely kalab, which is milk. So if, if if we're just if we're looking at the the Hebrew text, it's definitely definitely milk. So I'm unsure. I, I I'm not too familiar with that particular uh, version that you use. Uh, let me see. I'm just trying to. Yeah, you know, it doesn't really matter. I just thought it was really interesting because um, from a more, kind of a more Hebraic perspective. 
the the idea of that being a um, an ear of grain ties in with verse two and the concept of bread, um, which both the bread and the wine tie right into Christ, the symbols of Christ, as far as the Passover goes. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Edward, did you ever uh, get your sound thing figured out? I don't think he did. No, I think he may be frozen. Is he frozen? I think so. Here. Well, there's well I'm, I'm not. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah I'm terribly sleepy. All right. Good, good night, Jackie. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm it was, one, I'm it was wonderful. <laughs> I'm sorry. What did you say? I'm glad you stayed all this time. All this time, right. There is hard. one thing. I'd like to say just one little thing that doesn't really pertain, but the early in the, uh, when, Michael read the passage, the first passage. I heard the words, um, but my ways are different from your ways. I, yeah. I, my ways are above your ways. The last time I heard that was when I asked a pastor why they believed in uh, you know that the that Jesus had to come at the end of the hmm. futurist view. That's the last time I heard those words. That was given to me as the reason for the futurist belief. Interesting. That's not that's not very interesting, probably, but it struck me because it happened to me. Well, I will say this, Jackie, that. Um, when we approach that, I don't know where Michael stands on it, but when we finally get to that verse, which will be Lord willing next week or a couple weeks, uh, I don't interpret it the way most Christians interpret it. You know, most Christians interpret that passage. My ways are not your way, you know, for as high as the heaven, you know, uh, yeah. I believe that it's refer that our ways are now under the new covenant. Our ways are God's ways, and our thoughts yes. are His thoughts. Amen. Yes, yes. I, but I just thought it was strange to hear that after all this time. Yeah. Okay. Good night. I really, really enjoyed it all. I tried real hard to follow it. <laughs> uh, I'll have hard. to. I'll have to look at it again. I just don't retain things like I used to. Well, but good listen, night. Listen to it a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> good night, everyone. Night, night. Good night Jackie. Jackie. Love you. Right, Love right. you too. Love you all. Well, Jax, Tony, any thoughts on what we've gone over? I'm going to be leaving too, Ward. I enjoyed it. All uh, right, brother. It's always good to see I you. We, I think we've had the wine and milk both tonight. Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> God bless good you. Good to see you all. You too. Bye. Bless. Thanks for for this evening, and it's good to good that you're still uh, here and not raptured away. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I um, golly, I could have sworn I sent you a message, Jax. Um, a private message. Not a problem. Just glad you're okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm okay, and uh, put the word out that we're still having our study. Okay. We'll do.
All right. Love you, Jax. Take Good care. Good evening, both of you. Good evening. God bless. Take care. Thank you for being a part of the study. Thank you, guys.